before I call on her, um, I'll just like to read a brief profile about her. Mrs. Babatunde is the founder and chief operating officer at Rick et al., which powers the blog parentinvestment.com. Rick et al. is a social enterprise that partners with parents, schools, governments, and other stakeholders to equip the younger generation for the future. Ray is the pioneer DQ ambassador in Nigeria, first in Africa. I think that deserves a round of applause. And a member of the DQ coalition, comprising of the DQ Institute, the World Economic Forum, Varki Foundation, Google, Singtel, LG, U Plus, and leading NGOs, educators, and researchers worldwide. She will be speaking now. Uh, her name is Mrs. Charity Babatunde. Ladies and gentlemen, please can we welcome Mrs. Charity Babatunde. which is an area that I'm interested in. Can we just give maybe like two minutes? I can see people are coming in so that everybody is settled. So in the meantime, I'll be just in. Then we'll get to it. So let me say, I'm not a doctor. Um, and I remember when I sent out the flyer to one of the, um, well, to a group of friends. And it was said, it occurred to me that everybody had doctor, doctor, doctor in front of their name. So the person asked me, where is your own doctor? I said, I'm yet a doctor, and I'm not going to pretend to be one. I'm not going to stand here to pretend to be one. So I'm not going to make any medical claims or physiological claims, but I'm going to be talking from the standpoint of somebody who is a mother, and the way I like to describe myself is also somebody who is a parent, parenting enthusiast. I'm very interested in parenting, and I absolutely, absolutely, yeah, fantastic. I absolutely, absolutely, absolutely love the younger generation. I think in my mind, I kind of froze at a particular age. And somehow, I just haven't really... Sometimes my daughter, who's 25 and now, will ask me that, are you sure you lived your life as a young person? And I ask myself sometimes, because I think I was a bit too fast, but that's part of the gist that I'll be giving as we talk. And so I absolutely love working with young people especially teenagers. Some of my friends, because of what I do, say, okay, can they bring their four-year-old? I'm not very good with the ones that they cannot tell me exactly what they want. The ones that can talk and we can have conversations, much better. So, today I'm going to be talking, well, I've been asked to talk about STEM, the time. And um, the sub-theme is changing societal norms, care relations, and parenting in the digital age. When I got the letter of invitation, which is an absolute honor to have received, um, a couple of things ran through my mind when I saw the topic. Because I wasn't sure which one to focus on. Changing so societal norms is a topic on its own. Pair relations is a topic on its own. Parenting in the digital age are another major topic. So I decided to start from my comfort zone 
and hopefully we'll be able to talk on all of them. My comfort zone is actually parenting the digital age. And incidentally, today also happens to be the first World DQ Day. When my profile was being read out, um, it was said that I'm the DQ ambassador in Nigeria. DQ stands for Digital Intelligence Ocean. And what we do is we work with children and parents to ensure that our children are responsible digital citizens. So things like cyberbullying, things like digital empathy, things that actually can lead to neg the negative side of your mental wellness. We talk a lot about that. Lots of money through internet fraud can definitely lead to major, major mental health issues. So those are some of the things we talk about. So it was brilliant for me that it coincided today. Uh, I think we're about settled now. So let me give a bit of a story about myself and which is related. I may not be focusing entirely on suicide. And interestingly, it was when I sat down at the breakout session that I thought, I've never con contemplated suicide. But quite frankly, there was a time in my life that the thought of not existing anymore seemed attractive. I don't know how many of us are that. It's not, you can't, you don't want to kill yourself. You are, you, it's not that if you're applying to kill yourself. But if it ends somehow, Shaq, you won't mind. You understand? You won't mind. It occurred to me that that happened to me, and interestingly, that was probably maybe about three years ago when I lost a huge sum of money through fraud. It was traumatizing. And it coincided when I was going for surgery. So I felt if it was in my power to wake up, I wasn't going to exercise that power. Then just sleep and go. I don't think I would describe myself as suicidal because, quite frankly, I would not take my life. I'm not going to focus on that. But I will focus on how we can help our children through things that can lead them to getting to a point where they will contemplate ending their lives. And my story is interesting in the sense that I've always been a very fast child. I honestly cannot explain why. I got into secondary school at the age of nine, which then was a big deal. And forget my size, my pocket was bigger than me when I got into secondary school. I used to have people beg, can I help you carry your pocket? Are you sure you're okay? And I was very sharp in terms of, you know, not to, I'm not talking of intellectually, but talking and being very bold and confident. Then I got into um, secondary school, and I found out that life wasn't really what I thought it was. Things that you would say very innocently were taken out of context. Things that you didn't mean any harm about. People will come and it became an issue. And gradually that began to tell on my self-confidence, on my self-esteem and all that. Now, it also did not help. Like I said, I was a very fast child. That I'm the first of three children. My mother got married at the age of 21. Sorry, at the age of 20. And had me at the age of 21. Now that I'm done 21 plus, about 10 years or more after, I understand that it wouldn't have been easy for her at all. Having a child, how do you cope? Then she had three girls. And raising three children was no joke at all. So clearly, she must have had some issues with what probably would be normal teenage development. But she didn't understand. So she did the best thing she felt she could do. She had a school mother who was a child psychologist. And she asked me to go and spend holidays with her. If I was living there now, then it would have occurred to me that this is grounds for claiming mental health issues. But since I wasn't, I just thought she was very mean. And I'm sure many of us living here or sitting here have thought that our mothers were mean. The kind of things they put us through. But the truth of the matter is that they had our very best interest in now, bring it forward to the age we're living in. Some of us sitting here, our children actually think we're mean. The only difference is that now they understand that there's something called mental health and mental wellness. And that that thing that they're feeling can be depression or it can be somewhere on that spectrum. And the reason why they're aware, for various reasons, one of which is 
the advantage of the digital world, which gives you access to all kinds of information. So you can Google a feeling and it tells you that is depression. Or you Google and feel it as if my parents are deputy under pressure and they have a name for it. And so they're going there and they're finding out that a lot of things are happening. But then also the world has changed. And the way I like to put it is that the abnormal has become, is far becoming very normal. Things that ordinarily we would not have dreamt would ever happen are beginning to happen. We find out that a lot of things are grabbing for the attention of our children. The commodity that is being traded is information. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So they go there and they get every and any kind of information they want. Why don't they come to the parents? Why don't they go to the schools? We'll come to that later. So, we're living in the digital world where there's a lot of social media. And that, it's interesting that social media has me right in the middle. So everything is pointed there. There's a lot of social media that is going on. There's a lot of digital addiction that's going on. There's a lot of family, um, family time is being disrupted. Even when you're together, everybody is on their device. So you're supposed to be having conversations. You're not having conversations. Everybody is doing their own thing. That's the world we're living in. So you can't even pick up things. When back in the day, your parents or your parents or maybe your older siblings would pick up that it looks as if you are not happy. You are even too distracted to pick up to know whether there's something wrong. Or you just think, oh, what's wrong with this one? You're gonna be too tired. And like the last thing I said, Lagos alone is enough to stress anybody. So the last thing you want is to even add another person's stress to it, be it your child. So there's plenty that is going on. A lot of mood swing issues, a lot of academic pressure, a lot of bullying, cyberbullying, there are issues of gender identity, so many things that our children are having to go through. And then, recently, the sex for grades. And it's incredible how far back this thing has been happening. It's incredible how there are different shades and different variations of it. Our children are getting dependent on drugs. Not because they are bad people, but because they just want to ease the pain and the discomfort that they feel. Something is just not sitting right with them. I bet that there's anyone who knows anybody that is struggling with drugs or substance abuse. That child isn't a bad child. And I think that is one of the starting points that we need to get to. It's difficult in our culture because in our culture, the people who smoked weed were labeled as dropouts and people who were not thinking straight and they would never amount to anything. I am not soliciting that we encourage them to be smoking weed and all that. But what I'm saying is that that unfortunately is not the case. What is happening now is they're looking for things that can ease their pain. Another thing the speaker at the breakout session, sorry I didn't get your name, said was that he spoke somewhere and um, somebody said, oh that means we're all on drugs. And the truth of matter is that we all are on drugs. It's just that some of us are on different drugs. So some of us, it's chocolate cake. When we're not feeling happy, we go and eat the chocolate cake and we're okay. For some of us, it's shopping and you call it retail therapy. And you buy things that you cannot use in the next 10 years. For your child, it is either weed or it is social media or it is the internet. They're escaping to different things. Does that mean we should sit down and say, okay, you know what? Since everybody is on drugs, and everybody has, a, like the last speaker told us, that everybody has mental health. We're all just on different spectrums of that mental health journey. Some of us have very good mental health. Some of us have horrible mental health. Some of us will never even admit that we have something wrong with our mental health. But the truth of the matter is that we all do. And once in a while it manifests. And it manifests sometimes even in the way we raise our children. Unfortunately, some people tip and they go into things like suicide. A lot of our children are under a lot of pressure. Let's talk about pressure, immense pressure. I remember, and I'm going to share personal stories. I remember asking Mrs. Shofora that, am I allowed to be myself? Because usually when I have an opportunity to talk to people who consider it important enough to take their time out to come for sessions like this, the least I can do is to give them the truth. And I can give the truth 
from my own perspective and my own experiences. And my, I have two children, two, two young adults. My son is 22, my daughter is 25. And the way I like to describe them is that they have given me much needed experience that I need <laughs> on this journey called parents. They have shown me what it means to be a parent. And I'm grateful that we have an open enough relationship to be able to talk about any and everything. We may not have, in fact, a lot of times we don't agree. And we have agreed that it is okay to agree to disagree. And everybody moves on. But it doesn't stop me as a parent from airing my, 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 my opinion and telling them what it is. But I realize that at a certain age, I cannot force them. There are certain decisions that they would have to take by themselves. And I remember my son, who, when he was um, about to leave secondary school, asked him what he wanted to study, and he said, no. And I said, I do not know that you like reading like that. He said, law is law. I said, law is not like suits or <laughs> eh, eh, law and order. It's different. He said, law. What is your second choice? Law. Your third choice, he said, mom. And you know, by the time they say mom, end of discussion. So we left him. He started studying law. Thankfully, he was doing very well. Now, my husband, who in his mind thinks he's a lawyer, even though he's an engineer, feels that he would have been a brilliant lawyer, thought this was his dream coming to reality through his son. Unknown to be my grandfather too, oh, sorry, my father-in-law, who had always dreamt of a son in his family, felt that this was his dream come true. My son wakes up year two uni and decides he had picked up a passion for DJ, which I encourage him to do. And money, hopefully, you know, you won't ask me for too much money, you will mind your business. He had picked up a passion for DJ and he says, he doesn't want to be a lawyer anymore. <laughs> that was where the beginning of a lot of Wahala came. But he wouldn't push too much because he was the one who said he wanted to study law. So one day he was talking about nobody cares about him, the way he feels. My husband said, I'm the victim here. <laughs> you know how much I have been paid for school fees and 500 to one? I am the victim. Of course, my son couldn't understand it. By the time he went to speak with his, his grandfather, the father was totally upset. That pressure put a lot on him. I'm probably a more open-minded mother. Like, okay, he's 22. By the time he's 25, 26, he will realize that sometimes DJ may not fully pay the bills, and then he will, you know, and all that. But talk about unrealistic expectations, unrealistic standards, sorry expectations from society. How can you say you are a DJ? How does it even begin? And the children these days are getting bolder and wanting to follow their passion. So they're not saying they're not going to go to school. But I'm going to school, I've read economics, but I want to be a dressmaker. Or I want to be a chef. Or I want to be a YouTuber. Or I want to do what makes me happy. Because guess what? For them, they just want to be happy and rich. That's all they're looking for. Now, I wasn't bold enough, but when I think back, quite frankly, if I had a choice, I would have been a race car driver, a pilot, probably a DJ. But unfortunately, I did not have the privilege. Now, what has happened is we have grown up like that, and we're raising our children the way we were raised. We were not allowed to talk. They told you to either be lawyer, doctor, or engineer. You said yes, sir, even when you were not happy about it. You went to school, you came out, our own, they're bold enough, they'll say to you, I'll get the certificate, I'll give it to you. So right now we've managed the journey, managed the journey is in law school. Thank God. He has said, when I finish with the certificate, I will give it to you. No problem. I remember the compromise we had to get to was he said after he graduated, if he went straight to law school, he was going to fail. And I said, you don't fail, don't worry. So, let's talk about it. He said he wants to calm his brain. No problem. Do NYC and be calming your brain. Just calm it while you're in NYC. We agree. You know, when things want to happen and things are working in your favor, he ended up doing NYC in a law firm. And that was because his posting came out the day before he was to go to camp. The only person that could give us a letter was a lawyer. So, case one closed. 
what I'm saying is that parents, sometimes, we, we cannot give what we don't have. And some of us are so stressed raising our parents that we're projecting our fears, we're projecting our pressures, we're projecting everything on them. And it makes them all the more stressed. So they're under pressure how to act, how to look, how to behave. I have constant battles with my daughter. When you go to the shop, don't you find any cloth that is complete? <laughs>
She had been a straight A student, straight A student. She was working in one of the top consulting firms in Lagos. And then all of a sudden she had a breakdown one day. And that was when her parents discovered that she had been on, uh, on marijuana or something. She had said, what is the problem? She said the pressure was too much. The pressure not to fail was too much. She had become a trophy child. When you are introducing your daughter, you cannot introduce her by her name, Mrs. Ayo. You are saying, this is my child, she made a first class. This is my child, she's the a, a star student. This is my child, and you don't know that by so doing, yes, it's coming from a good place. Just like it was coming from a good place from my, my, my mom, who took me to her um, school mother to psychoanalyze me and be sure that everything was okay. You know, it was, it's coming from a good place. But guess what? It has an impact on the children that we do not realize. We're talking about stepping the tide. What are some of the things that we can do? So the way we parent is even enough to put a lot of pressure. One of the things that I say is that the goal of parenting hasn't changed, but the method must change. Now, from the children's perspective, what does growing up in a digital age look like? Or the way my daughter put it, adult. What does adulting look like? Interestingly, yesterday she was having a conversation with a 10-year-old um, cousin who was doing his assignment and then we were talking to him. And he said, he said something to the effect that he can't get to just grow. She said, eh, be careful what you wish for. That when you start this adulting, you can't press pause. That is a trap. They didn't tell us that there are so many things. Her first shock was that when she graduated from Italy, she would no longer be collecting pocket money. It was a major shock to her. It was a shock to me that she thought she was still collecting pocket money. It was a major shock to her. So she thinks that adulting is too hard. There are so many things they don't tell you. There are bills you have to pay. You have to do this. You have to behave in a particular way. You have to wake up and go to work. You have to. Then why can't you just remain? Meanwhile, if you had told them at that age, you are just stay where you are, they would have had you there. They were part of the problem. We will get to that. So, adulting is hard. There are a lot of things they're thinking about. They're thinking about their grades, their friends, how they fit in. Everybody wants to belong, including you and I sitting here. The difference is what you want to belong to. And our children naturally must those hierarchy of need. Let's go back and remember. Belonging is one of the basic needs of human beings. They want to belong. Everybody wants to fit in. They want to fit into something. Sometimes that means a lot of things, especially if as parents we have not properly defined what it is that the kind of things that they should be fitting into. So they have a lot of things going on. Grades, assignments. Ah! Assignments can even be parents, the tasks, the parents. Self-esteem issue. There's a lot of body shaming that is going on. They're very savage on social media. So everything that you do, everything that you say, somebody is calling you out on social media. That's what happens when you live in the digital age. You can't hide anymore. Our lecturers can no longer hide. The students can no longer hide. Nobody can hide anymore. A lot of people are forming and faking it on social media. And unfortunately, our children get, because they live there, sometimes it's easy to distort reality with what is fake. So they're comparing their real life with a fake life. None of us will post a selfie that is bad. We take 20 and choose the best and post it. We record 200 times and say, does this one sound okay? How does this sound okay? Sometimes I wonder, I'm not a doctor. I don't sub signs of mental health. We are making 200 pictures and posting one. So they got to all the other They're living in a place where they're afraid of missing out. That's what FOBO is. FOBO is fear of missing out. So they're constantly on their phone because it's as if, and we are all guilty to We are addicted. It's just that we kind of feel that as parents, we are allowed to. And when I say parents, please let me say that I'm talking to parents and people I describe as parent figures, teachers, educators, those who have the responsibility to raise the younger generation. We appear as if those things only happen. Check yourself. When you get on the plane and they're giving you a drill, they'll say that in the event of unlikely loss of oxygen, that the mask will drop. What do they say you should do? Put for yourself first before you help another person. We need to look at ourselves. 
and find out what exactly is going on, what are the things that we're projecting. So the lives that they're living is a life of where they're looking at followers, they're looking at friends, they're living with what we called truly parents. And they're wondering whether they're enough. Am I popular enough? Am I thin enough? Am I rich enough? Am I smart enough? Am I enough? And everything is consistently telling them that they are not enough. And then they come to the house and the parents are telling them you are not enough. Your grades are not good enough. You are not well behaved enough. You are not acting right enough. So where exactly do we want them to go? There's a lot of sadness, a lot of anxiety, which could lead to depression, which could lead to suicide, and a lot of things happening. And we're only giving what it is that we have. It's unfortunate that I was looking at the newspapers and I found out that in the last six months, 42 people, in top, um, 42 people of those who have committed suicide are students. In the last six months. Some over exam issues, some over my friend matter, some over different issues. But they've been committing, and these are the real people because I got their images from them. These are people who, like you and I, their parents had great aspirations uh, uh, dreams for them. But guess what? It all ended. So, what is it that we can do as parents or caregivers raising children in this age? And how do we step the child? Ola Shari International School was the one who gave me the step of the So I decided to play around with it a lot. Like I said, I love much. And I look at life like the ocean. And there are waves and there are seasons. Different things happen at different times. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. Sometimes things don't go the way we want. And unwanted and unexpected things happen. Like our children getting depressed. Like our children making poor choices. Like our children doing things that would not make us happy. But there's a sport that um, is gradually becoming popular in Lagos. And it's called surfing. How many of us are familiar with surfing? Okay, how many of us surf? <laughs> How many of us surf? <laughs> How many of us wish we could surf? Yeah. Now let's bring it closer home. You see, in the time, in the waves of life, right? It's the same. Why, if you if you look, you find out that we have more foreigners who surf than Africans. It has just become uh, something that they are trying to pick up. And it's the same when the parents. When my daughter got into you. You don't go for a very Nigerian mother. I followed her. You still on this line. And I could hear the expatriate um, uh, students say, I wonder what's wrong with all these people. These Africans, their mothers keep following them to the UK. We're doing everything ourselves. I could hear by pretending that if I wasn't getting it, that's your problem. Me and my daughter, you might not be here. Have you done your uh, vaccination? Have you done this one? Have you done that? That's the way we are. We're afraid to actually get into the water. We're afraid to leave them at a particular age. And that leads to some of the problems that we see. So something is where you ride the waves. When the waves come, you get on the board and you go. And, uh, and also somebody who loves acronyms a lot. So I thought, okay, what acronym can I give them here today that they will remember? So I decided to play around with the acronym SURF. And that's what we're going to be talking about. How can we help our children? How can we parent more effectively? How can we stem the tide? We can do that by learning to surf. What does surf mean? Speak, understand, resist, and focus. Speak, understand, resist, and focus. Let's start with the first one. Speak the truth about life. And many of us tell lies as parents. Plenty lies. We don't tell them the truth about life. And we think we're trying to protect them. We don't talk about our mistakes. We do not tell them that adulting is hard. We don't tell them. We don't tell them that people will disappoint you. People will betray you. We do not tell them that people will shame you. We don't tell them that you will fail. We don't tell them that they will make mistakes. We don't tell them that there are consequences for the things you do. We don't tell them that sometimes you will experience loss. It could be loss of life, loss of a loved one. We don't talk about the important things. So when they encounter those things, they're confused. They don't know what to do. We give the impression that we were born perfect. 
and we have lived very perfect lives. We never failed. I tell my children, when I was 14, I got onto the university campus at the age of 14, and I saw freedom and I collected it with everything I had. And I failed so badly. By the time I woke up, I was ready to give uh, uh, my academic school attention. Unfortunately, my father died. So I was totally discouraged. I failed to disappoint him. But you know, because I had age on my side, it helped. It helped in the sense that I was able to catch up. And thereafter, and at that time, my mother was 36. So this is somebody who didn't know how to deal with normal growing up developmental issues. And she's now starting with three girls at the age of 36. She could only parent us the best she knew how to. And it was a lot of controlling. I tell the story of when one day when I was going out and I was wearing a spaghetti, nice sleepless dress, long skirt. My mother said I would not tolerate prostitution in my house. And I was wondering, how did we reach there? <laughs> dress that I'm wearing. So we had different issues. But we don't tell them that no, people will disappoint you. You will have friends that will betray you. We give the impression that the world is rosy. And for those of us that are very religious, we use God for me to say it's not your portion. So I say Nigerians, our default copy mechanism is denial. We feel it will not happen to us, therefore there is no need to talk about it. And if we talk about it, it's as if we're calling it. So let's do it. But in the reality is that it happens. We need to speak the truth to our children. We need to also allow them to be able to speak the truth. Because what happens is that sometimes when we don't do that, our children fail to adult food. You know how when you are loading a program on computer and it says content fails to load? Some of our children have failed to launch. And what happens is to cope, they now begin to depend on different things. They now get to a place where they are depressed. They now get to a place where they are gravely unhappy. When they have different issues going on. And because you have never even told them that you have gone through depression and you have gone through great, great feelings of anxiety and unhappiness, they think that there's something wrong with them. You've never told them that you liked a boy that did not like you. Or you liked a girl that did not So they need to think, I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. I'm the only one. If you want to parent effectively in this digital age, you must be able to talk about any and everything. You must be able to talk about feelings. You must be able to talk about any and everything. But let me quickly move on. One of the things that we need to do is to create a safe space for our children. So I'm still on this, I need to run. What is a safe space? The safe space is where they can come to and they can talk about you. You is understanding. And I like Stephen Covey's fifth habit, which says seek first to understand, then to be understood. How many of us understand the purpose of parenting? Why are we parents? Some of us think it's to show off. Some of us think it's to say, okay, we fulfill the job shot of multiply. Some of us, we don't even know why we're parenting. Who are we parenting? Do you know who your child is? Are you trying to raise Ola Mide as if he is I or him? Do you understand the nature of who you're parenting? What environment are you parenting your child in? Because the way you parent a child, and some of us, because the digital world has exposed them to different cultures, and we want them to behave like uh, ex merchants of one side, and want them to behave like Nigerians on the other side. This is as a joke, and uh, I hopefully I'll round up very quickly. Um, I remember my children when they came back from uni. And I said, come, you people are, are falling my hand. That, can't you hear every other person speaking for them? After all the money we pay, you are still speaking like that. <laughs> can't you at least put on a little bit of the accent? They don't have time for that, but that's a joke. Okay, so we need to understand, how do we parent our children? But guess what? What I just said as a joke, so parents take it very seriously. Yes. 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 So yes. don't laugh about it, but some parents actually take it very seriously. And then when do we parent? So yes, is for speak the truth. You is understand. Understand who your parents, who your um, parent is, but also understand the pressures they go through. One of the things that we do in our organization is that we conduct this anonymous survey where we go to talk to students, and it's called what we wish our parents do. So tell us some things that you wish you could talk to your parents about, and why haven't you done so? And it's interesting that 43.9% of the responses we get have to do with mental health and stress-related issues. 27 have to do with sex related issues, 16 academics, and all that. Um, if you're interested, we have a program on YouTube called What We Wish Our Parents Do, where we try to deal with the different uh, issues that they talk about. But just to give an example, 
What do we wish our parents to one of the respondents? I'm struggling with depression. Why haven't you told your parents? Nigeria does recognize depression and suicidal tendencies as a disease, and they take it as attention seeking. So that's why it's good that we're having programs like this to enlighten people. Another one says not all their friends' children are the same they seem like. So you're constantly comparing them, can you not see this person very good? And they refuse to agree. That's why they have the bothered to tell them. Another one says, I like my mom to know how much I like her. And I like to be like her. But she's wrong of just shushing me and saying, just move away. What's wrong with you? Those are some of the things that give rise to the feelings that they have. I wish my dad and mom knew how to communicate with me. I also wish I could tell them about my problem with school, especially financially. I want them to know I'm broke. And what you are saying to your child, look, nobody wants to be at the bottom rung of the ladder. I'm not saying you should go and steal to take care of your children. But you need to have conversations with them to keep their self-esteem high, even where they cannot afford it. Another thing, I think this is good because this is a family of most of the people here probably have children in Olashere. It's the same environment and all that. Because of this peer pressure thing in adults, don't take your child into an environment where you know your child will not rise. Where you know that your child will be looked at because your self-esteem is really horrible and it can lead to all kinds of things. What is R for? R is resist. And what are you to resist as a parent? Resist over parenting. Because it leads to poor coping and problem solving skills. We both have parents. The other day I went out with a friend a couple of years ago. My friend who had an 18-year-old son we went to Muson to watch a play. And we came out and she said, let me hold your hand to cross the road. And I looked at her, you're right. How do you hold the hand of an 18 year old? And this is somebody who schools are bored. That is how it is. We do not allow our children to experience life. So we're overprotecting and it is causing a lot of damage. And that makes them predisposed to anxiety and depression. Those self esteem, they have an unrealistic view of life. They don't really understand what is going on. So we need to resist the urge to overcorrect. We also need to stop shaming. You know, it's interesting how our conversation style in Nigeria is just to be dissing people. You just shame. We say things very sarcastically. You want to say somebody is looking nice, you have there's a way you say, I'll catch you with this Why can't you just say that? You know, and then they're and sometimes because we do not finish the sentences, you are not even sure. If somebody is feeling bad about themselves, what then happens is they fill in the blank with what they think based on the concept that they have in their mind. And they're thinking, is there something wrong with you? Let me think that I'm looking, it's not alright. Maybe there's something wrong and all that. Let's learn. Shaving has been, has always been a very poor educator. A lot of us are damaged adults. But we don't want to agree. We feel that we have, age has removed the damage. But when you press hard, you find out that that damage comes out. And hurting people only hurt people. Shame will lead to them thinking about addiction and thinking about suicide. And the last one is F, focus. You need to focus on what really matters. So S is speak the truth. Tell them the truth about life. You understand the people you are parenting. Our resistance the urge to overparent and to shame when they do not meet up to your expectations. And F, focus on what really matters. What is it that really matters? One, to focus on the goal of parenting. What is the goal of parenting? To raise fully functional adults who are useful not just to themselves but to the society that they find themselves in. That is the goal of parenting. And we need to consistently remind ourselves, this thing that I am doing, would it be in the best interest of this child and society? If not, you need to change your method. The goal of parenting has not changed. My mother's goal was to make sure that I was useful to the society and to myself. My goal is to make sure that my child is useful to the society and to the him or herself. But the method we would choose, just like many of us do not use grinding stone to grind pepper, we will go and buy blender. Some of us are trying to use grinding stone to raise our children. And it really doesn't work. Am I saying throw away the old? No. But you need to properly understand the environment that you're parenting and raise them well. So remember what the goal is and then focus on the fact that numbers do not define your child. A lot of us have lived our lives being defined by numbers. I live my life being defined by numbers. The weight on the scale, the balance in my account, the grades that I came up with, the number of people that like me, the number of people that follow me. Our children are looking, how many people are following you? How many followers do you have? How many people like your post? How many people are doing this? Who are those? What are my grades? Numbers do not define you. Recently, 
Americans got I am, Americans got talent. The winner, Cody Lee. Cody Lee is a childhood, uh, a tradition, artistic child. And he won one million dollars. But guess what? His mother or his parents mm. understood who he was and their focus was on making him the best version of himself. Afterwards, I think I've extended my time. What is the other thing you should focus on? Create force values and equip them with survival skills. These days, to survive, you need resilience. Our first speaker spoke about it. We need our children to be able to get up and bounce back. Things will go wrong. You get up, you pick yourself, and you bounce back. But guess what? It's not enough to say get up, pick up yourself, and bounce back. There's a process to it. You work the journey with them. Time will not allow me to talk about it. We also need to give the teacher our courage. They need to be very courageous. You need to be courageous to stand up to a lecturer who says, if you don't sleep with me, I will not want your life. And you look at him and you say, I'm not going to sleep with you, and there's nothing you're going to do about it, because I'm going to report you. And you need to create a safe place where your daughter or your son can come in and say, this is what happened. You don't say, you to why it's not your dress, is always shows. You find a way to create that safe space for them, and bring them with the skills that they need. One of those skills is kindness. Because guess what? People have to be kind to themselves before they can be kind to others. And many people are very unkind. And many parents are very, very unkind. They think they are. They think it's in the best interest of the child, but they're doing a lot of things. Let me end by saying that depression and suicide are sometimes some of the unwanted stuff that the tide brings in as we serve them. And my hope is that as we speak, we understand, we resist, and we focus, we'll be able to step the tide. Thank you.